Good afternoon, and thanks for joining Washington, D.C.-based Jennifer Schausman Associates in our Get Far Saturday 2020 complimentary webinar series. As you know, the FAR or Federal Acquisition Regulations is the rulebook that the federal government must follow in making purchases. Our webinar series pulls from contracting experts to explain each part of the FAR. It is complimentary and recorded. We'll post all of the recordings on our website and YouTube channel where we have over 300, 300 government contracting webinars available for download. Special thanks to our webinar partner in the series, the National Veteran Small Business Coalition Education Foundation. Please visit their website to learn more about the organization. We would also like to thank our friends at Open the Fire for their sponsorship. If your organization is interested in sponsoring the series or one part, please contact hello at jenniferschaus.com. And now a little bit about us. We work with primarily large businesses to help them navigate the federal marketplace. We work with both product and service companies as well as software firms. Our clients span the globe and include publicly traded organizations in a variety of sectors. We provide market analysis reports, contract administration, contract vehicle assistance, and more. All of our services can also be built into a training program for your team. Learn more about us on our website. And now we would like to let you know about some ways to, learn, to reach the government and government contractors through us. We offer advertising and sponsorship opportunities through our weekly newsletter and also in our webinar series. For pricing or to place an order, please email us at hello at jennifershops.com. Now let's move on to learn a bit about today's speaker, Don Kenanitz. You can find his contact information on the screen here. And today we are covering FAR Part 29 with Don. Thank you so much for joining us today. We, really, we are really thankful for your participation in the series. The floor is my ears. Please let me know when you're ready for your next slide. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It just past noon. Uh, and I um, hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I imagine some of you may be working from home. I'm not sure. Uh, our office uh, uh, it reopened about a week or two ago, uh, and people are gradually filtering back in, but we had to make an immediate transition to working from home, something I do frequently, so it wasn't any difficulty for me. Uh, and I, uh, I actually enjoy doing it, but uh, I understand some people don't, <laughs> especially if you have kids. Fortunately, mine are all grown. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about FAR, Part 29, and uh, I I'm get, which is taxes, and I'm guessing that some of you probably were caught by the uh, caption taxes and less by FAR Part 29, as um, most people aren't very familiar with FAR Part 29, uh, and it's not something that even I go to very often, frankly, and I have been practicing for 40 years in government contracting. Uh, which leads me into, I guess I should say a little bit about my background. Uh, I'm a, a principal with uh, Eco and & Company, uh, and I've been there for several years. I've known the founder of the firm, Eric Cohen, since the early 1980s when we worked at the same national firm together as we were beginning our careers. Uh, we later left and went to a large regional firm. I stayed there for a while. Eric left and started his own firm back in the early 90s, and we're about 75 people today. Uh, we providing tax consulting, outsourced accounting, and uh, audits with these compilations and we do a lot of government contracting i've specialized in government contracting for all 40 years of my career i was a partner with uh, a national firm for 15 years and headed up the dc area uh, government contracting practice uh, and i have done uh, probably more than 500 audits of financial statements and of those i would say probably more than 300 or more of government contractors. I've also done tremendous amounts of government contract consulting, everything from assisting companies with putting together cost proposals uh, and budgeting, um, uh, incurred cost submissions, DCA audit defense. Uh, we do form SF 1408 audits or what are often called uh, accounting system reviews. Uh, so we're, I'm pretty knee deep in the government contracting and have been for a long time. And anybody that wants to email me with a question, my contact information is there. Uh, feel free to do so. Uh, I take questions all the time. If you go to our website, you'll see that we have a government contracting newsletter, and I've written quite a number of articles for that. So today, we're going to be talking about taxes. And uh, I'm ready for the next slide. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. So FAR 29 is really, oh, I'm sorry, go back one. I, I didn't see it come up. Okay. Um, the FAR 29, as I mentioned, is a, a really short section and deals with a highly specialized area. Uh, and, the reason, and the reason it's short, again, is because the guidance is relatively abbreviated for a FAR section. If you go to a FAR section like Part 31, which deals with the cost principles, 
it's quite lengthy and quite detailed and quite specific. And that's true of many other FAR sections as well. This one is not. Um, it's You can read it in 20 minutes. Uh, and although I won't tell you that you can understand it in 20 minutes. Um, but there's a reason that it's a short section, and uh, we'll talk about that on the next slide. And the reason is spelled out right in the preamble, uh, 29101, which is, and, and this is directed at contracting officers. Contract tax problems are essentially legal in nature, and very widely, Specific tax questions must be resolved by reference to the applicable contract terms and to the pertinent tax laws and regulations. Therefore, when tax questions arise, contracting officers should request assistance from the agency designated, uh, designated legal counsel. So that's why this is just short. It, it's only providing broad guidance, uh, and the guidance is directed to contracting officers uh, and not really contractors. Uh, which is also a little bit different from most FAR sections, which re really are directed to providing guidance to both COs, which I'll refer to contracting officers at, uh, as from here on out, uh, as well as the contractors. So we can go to the next slide. All right, and so what may have caught your eye when you were looking at this seminar, I don't know how many of you were attracted and went, oh, I wanna know about FAR 29. I suspect that group is in the minority. Uh, but probably more of you were drawn to the caption, as I said earlier, taxes. But FAR 29 doesn't directly address income taxes, which is, I suspect, what most people are interested in. Um, although it does allow for the fact that income taxes could affect contracts, and that would typically be indirectly. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, the indirectness part, a little bit later. Uh, but it really only addresses specifically a couple of particular items in regard to contract matters matters. However, given that I'm, I'm going to imagine that many of you tuned in to hear a little bit about income taxes, uh, I am going to just digress from my slides to take a moment and talk about those. Uh, and that's something that even though I'm not a tax specialist, our firm has plenty of them who also are very familiar with government contracting and the issues that confront government contractors. Uh, so even though I'm not a tax specialist, I do have a very, very good working knowledge of uh, tax strategies for government contracting. Uh, and so I'm just going to talk briefly about a, a couple of those here. So most of you, uh, or many of you at least, I suspect most of you are familiar with you know, different corps or different ways that companies can organize, or we call it a business formation. And that is to say, how, how one can legally organize a business. So a proprietor is, you know, very old sing, single person running a, a, a firm. We don't see that in government contracting. That tends to be largely limited to mom and pop retail and maybe some mom and pop service type things. And that's where the, you, you don't actually file anything with anybody, you're just yourself. Um, but most, most of the companies we're gonna come across uh, these days in government contract are either gonna be LLCs, limited liability companies, or corporations. Some people think there are two types of corporations, a C corporation, or sometimes called a regular corporation, and an S corporation, that's not true. Legally, there's only one type of corporation. Uh, you become an LLC or a corporation by applying for, for that status in the state in which your company is domiciled. Um, so uh, if you're in Maryland, you might choose, you don't have to, but you might choose to be domiciled in Maryland if that's where your headquarters is, and you would apply to become either an LLC or a corporation. And once you've done that, that, that is your designation. The reason you want to be one of those two typically is to limit liability. That is, you want to limit the liability to the, uh, to the company. So if, if there's some kind of litigious event, you don't want the, you know, yourself as an owner or, or an owner group to be on the hook, which you would be if you were a sole proprietor or partnership. So hence the reason for a limited liability company uh, or a corporation. A limited liability company is what we call a pass-through entity. So the activity is uh, reported on a partnership return, but it passes through to the individuals. Uh, and even though it's reported on a partnership return, uh, that doesn't make the company a partnership for legal reasons. So it retains its identity as an LLC. Uh, so, but the income, the deductions, various credits will flow through to the individual owners. 
uh, and a corporation is not by nature a pass-through entity, and you have, but you can elect a, a status that most of you heard of called sub-S or subchapter S status. That's a tax election. It has nothing to do with your legal existence as a corporation. So uh, sometimes I'll say, well, hear people say, well, I don't want to become an S corp because then I'll have liability, and that is simply not true. It has no effect on the legal aspect. Um, Typically, uh, yeah, most clients that we see want to be either an LLC or a corporation who's elected S status. Uh, and I'll point out that you can be an LLC and elect to file as an S corporation. Now, that may sound odd. You might say, well, why? And the reason, the main reason is, is because under an LLC, the owners are treated like partners. So any amounts paid to those partners uh, it cannot be salary. They they end up being either distributions of the partnership earnings or what we call guaranteed payments to partners, which are sort of in, in the nature of salary in that they are fixed amounts to be paid, but they don't qualify as salary for any number of things that are salary associated. So an LLC member doesn't get the opportunity uh, to participate in a company 401k plan, for example, or in many other benefit plans because he or she is not considered to be an employee. Uh, so some LLCs will elect to file as an S corporation so that they then can avail themselves of those benefits. Uh, when they do that, then the owners can be treated as employees for tax purposes, and then they can participate in benefit plans and so on. Uh, the second, so, so that, that those are all factors you want to consider you know, it, whether you've already formed a company or even if you are one, whether if you're, if you're either of those should, if you're an LLC, should you consider filing as an S? If you are a corporation and you're not an S, should you consider switching to S? And there's some complications with that, but it can be done. Uh, the other thing is that uh, many, I would say the ma pretty significant majority of contractors here in the DC area are service companies. They provide services as opposed to manufacturing uh, and things like that. So service companies can typically use the cash method of accounting, and that is you can report your income and your expenses for tax purposes on the cash basis, and that can be a major advantage if you're a growing company, because what will happen is if you're a growing company, if your sales are increasing, your accounts receivable are going to increase each year. Your accounts payable are going to increase too, uh, and they might typically increase at about the same rate. But as long as you're growing, that means that each year, some of the revenue you earned in that year or recognized for that year will not have been collected. And that revenue then doesn't get taxed until later. So you don't avoid or eliminate taxes, you defer them to later years. And so if you're a government contractor and you start out in year one and now you find yourself in year 10 and you've grown every year, you have pushed taxes off beginning in one year all the way to year 10. And at some point, you might start to, to see a decline in revenue. And at that point, those differences begin to reverse themselves and you start to incur taxes. But there's what we call time value of money. And that is to say that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar tomorrow or certainly 10 years from now. So paying a tax 10 years later uh, is cheaper because you can, you can set 40 cents aside and the interest on it will will equal a dollar, let's say, in 10 years. So the cash method is also something we advise our government contractor companies to consider. Many of you hopefully have gotten good advice and are already on the cash method. And if you have not, you can switch, but you will have to calculate the cumulative deferral through the date of switch, and you'll have to take it in income typically over a period of four to six years. That still can be a good thing. Uh, and it's done on a straight line basis. So. Uh, I know I've just kind of packed a lot of information in there and you don't have any notes, it's not on a slide, but I wanted to get out that, that out there because I did think that, do think that many of you are, are uh, probably thinking of this seminar in terms of that. But now I'm going to move on to what FAR 29 is really about. So it's, it really addresses only a few matters, and those are federal excise taxes and, and you know, how are those treated on government contracts? Uh, taxes on certain foreign contract payments that are required to be held by contracting agencies. So there are instances where when payments are made to a foreign company, uh, they may have uh, tax, there may be various taxing authorities that require taxes on those payments and the government will withhold them. It's no different than when you go to a store and you pay sales tax 
the store is only collecting the sales tax. It then has to turn around and remit it to the state, and it gets a small administrator for doing that. But it itself is not charging you a sales tax, so to speak. And then we have state and local taxes, uh, in, and there is some specific guidance in FAR 29 relating to specific states where unusual situations have arisen. One of those, for example, is North Carolina. I won't be getting into a lot of that detail because it would bore you, and I'm going to say up front that much of what we're going to go through here relatively quickly is not going to apply to the vast majorities that are in my audience today, nor has it ever applied to the vast majority of companies I've dealt with over the past 40 years. Uh, but it does come into play in some instances, so it's worth you know having the knowledge that that FAR 29 is at least out there, and that you know you might want to check it if there are any of the issues that we're going to discuss or you know, list right there in this slide. If any of those uh, affect, could or, or do affect a contract that you you either already have or are looking to obtain, uh, it's worthwhile knowing about this section. So we, with that, we can go to the next slide. All right, so contracting officers, and as I said at the outset, this is this section is actually directed more toward contracting officers than contractors. Uh, contracting officers are specifically directed to get legal assistance in these two situations. Whenever there's a question about whether a tax imposed on the federal government is valid, all right, so let's say a state imposes some kind of a tax. The government has what's known as sovereign immunity from federal taxes, and as a rule, states have sovereign immunity from, um, from federal government taxes, which is why, for example, states can issue, uh, states and localities can issue things like industrial development bonds and municipal bonds, and the interest on those bonds is not taxable at the federal level, and therefore those bonds can typically yield, yield a lower interest amount than a corporate bond would. So a corporate bond at 9%, uh, is going to be subject to federal income tax, and that might knock the real return down to five or six percent. And therefore, municipal and state bonds can be issued five or six percent, and they'll find plenty of takers because that income isn't taxed. So they can they can essentially do lower uh, cost financing. Uh, but sometimes they'll try to impose these taxes on the federal government, and there are questions about whether or not uh, they're legit because of the sovereign immunity of the federal government. And so legal counsel is to be sought when there's any any uh, the, discussion or debate about this, uh, whether a tax is valid, whether a, an exemption should be requested, or whether a refund of tax is already paid by a contractor, potentially on behalf of the government. Uh, so that requires legal counsel. Contracting officers are not, not suited. They don't have the specialized knowledge to address that. And the other one is these purchases from a foreign source, uh, where there may be issues related to tax treaties, uh, foreign tax relief programs, and just a basket of other stuff. Again, this is pretty heavy stuff. So, yeah, I, I have almost never encountered it, and most government contracting officers have never encountered it, encountered it, and that's why they're being told to go get legal counsel. So we can go to the next side, slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, the government has immunity from certain taxes, uh, but that doesn't mean the contractor isn't subject to those taxes. And I'm gonna talk about a more specific example after we get through a few more slides. Uh, that will hopefully show how this line sometimes get blurred, or sometimes contractors think that some of the expenditures they're making in a contract should be exempt from state taxes, when in fact they're not. So, and that's why I've written here that the line can be blurry in some cases. So it's important to consider these things before a contract is signed. Uh, when you've got a tax where the federal government is either immune or exempt, I should have added exempt, it, it, but the contractor is the point at which the tax is likely to be first imposed. Uh, some government action may be required so that the contractor it's himself or herself is not burdened with this tax. Uh, and that's the, probably the single most important takeaway that you can get from FAR 29 itself. It's that you have to be alert to these things. So we can go to the next slide. Okay. So the, the first the first group of taxes are what are called federal excise taxes, and if you ever look closely, you'll you'll you might have seen these when you go to buy tires or something, where you know the tire company is advertising a sale online, and and then you get there and the tire that you thought was going to be $123 is $155 because there's a federal excise tax that was in at the website, 
and then there's you know um, an old tire replacement tire disposal charge you know for recycling the things and uh, some other fees for balancing things like that so uh, that's just one example of an excise tax um, so FAR 29 only talks about two kinds and one's manufacturers excise taxes and then special fuels excise taxes imposed on diesel fuel and some uh, special motor fuels I was a long time sailor and I can remember back in the 90s, late 90s, I believe it was, that they imposed a, uh, a tax on diesel fuel uh, for recreational use. And then they colored the, ga the, 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 the gas, the diesel, the diesel fuel, just so you could tell it from the taxed versus untaxed. Uh, be, and it was strictly a, a, a revenue raising thing, which is why they, they did it. Uh, they needed money and they decided that they, yacht owners, and I didn't have a yacht, I assure you, uh, could afford it. Uh, so, uh, in many instances, the government's exempt from those. Uh, so, if a contractor is buying diesel fuel, not in this, and the diesel fuel is going to particularly figure into the example I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. If the diesel fuel is not being purchased on behalf of the government specifically, uh, and as opposed to being used in a contract, then the government would generally be accept, exempt. Uh, but if there's any doubt about this, again, the CO is told to go to agency legal counsel. Uh, this will make a little you'll have this this will make a little more sense to you in a moment when I talk about uh, uh, the, the the sample case. So we're ready for the next slide. I'm not sure. Uh, next slide, please. I'm not sure if uh, anyone's listing. So, is this the, uh, oh, here we the go. next slide, please? Yeah, okay. All right. Now, there are some specific exemptions provided. So, any purchases by the federal government, now keep in mind, purchases by the federal government are different than purchases from a contractor doing work for the federal government. Right. I want to make this distinction. But, that said, when the federal government buys, I should say buys or leases, but usually we're going to be talking about buys or purchases, items that are for the exclusive use of the state or a subdivision thereof, or by a nonprofit educational institution, the government's exempt. Uh, anything for shipment to a foreign company, government's exempt. Items that are purchased for further manufacture up the line, uh, possibly be put in government storage and then sent out at a later date to a different contractor for more work. Those are exempt from federal excise taxes. And em emergency vehicles, any type of emergency vehicle that the government purchases itself, though it may do so through a contractor, but it is essentially making the purchase itself. It's merely directing the contractor to make, make that purchase. Um, the, the excise taxes on those are exempt. So we can go to the next slide. Um, Government specifically exempt from the communications excise tax that you see on your phone bill, your your, your both your uh, regular landline bill if you still have one, and your cell phone bill, uh, and as well as the federal highway users tax. Um, now this doesn't ex extend to contractors. I want to make sure. So you may be using tons of telephones in performance of a government contractor, but the excise taxes are not. You're not exempt from those. All right. So I just want to point that out. Now you may be installing a system for the government that uses communications. And uh, the bill for that will be uh, exempt from taxes. And there might be rare occasions where that bill passes through a contractor, so because the contractors agreed to administer it for the government. That could be a contract. Um, in that case, you know, you'd have to be careful to make sure that, that the you get the exemption. Uh, so the idea is, as I said earlier, is that the government has to be deemed to be the purchaser of the supplies in, any, in order for any of these exemptions to apply. And that's not just for federal excise taxes, uh, but we're going to get to a moment some other kind. Uh, so we can go to the next slide now and get to the second category of taxes in, and these are state and local taxes. The first thing we think of are sales taxes, uh, which are more, uh, more accurately called sales and use taxes because those taxes fall on the person buying. The whole big debate about Amazon not charging taxes for so many years had to do with the fact that technically a user, whoever buys the product, 
is responsible for that tax because it's called a sales and use tax. Uh, and it's really the use that's being taxed. The whole idea though was that low, states can tell retailers within their uh, state lines that you've got to collect this tax by law and then remit it to us. Uh, but when you bought, bought something from out of state, uh, where the company didn't have something called Nexus, which is, a, 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 I'm not going to get into what it is, but essentially uh, they weren't, they weren't, didn't have any attachment to the state where you live. Um, that other state was on, a, uh, the retailers of that other state were under no obligation to collect these taxes and remit them. Instead, you were supposed to declare them on your own state tax return. If you ever look closely at your state tax return, you'll actually see a place for that. Companies, in fact, do this all, a lot. Uh, but individuals rarely do. So that's why that big that brouhaha was just recently uh, settled by uh, uh, a different Supreme Court decision uh, after about 20 years of Amazon not having to do it. Uh, but the government is almost always exempt from these things. These are these state and local taxes uh, because they, again, have sovereign immunity. Uh, once again, this exemption doesn't extend to contractors. Uh, except in cases where the contractors act, in, act as an agent of the government. When I say agent of the government, they're they're buying things on behalf of the government for the government as a act as a separate activity. Okay, so you buying a contractor buying supplies to perform a contract is not buying on behalf of the government. But there are instances where a company is directed to buy certain supplies on behalf of the government in order to perform a contract. And in that case, there would be an exemption. Uh, from state and local taxes. In order to make sure you get that exemption, uh, you normally have to get the federal government to execute what's called a Form 1094, which is essentially a relatively short form where it, it indicates what's being purchased and that it's being purchased on behalf of the government. It's signed by a contracting officer and it essentially certifies or, or affirms that uh, the contractor is entitled to not have these taxes imposed on these purchases being made on behalf of the government. Uh, so if you ever encounter a situation where this becomes an issue, you can simply, you know, uh, pull up a 1094, maybe look at it for a little bit and talk to your contracting officer. It's always best, again, to do this in advance to avoid uh, problems down the road where you get stuck with what should have been the government's bill. Okay, next slide. Uh, I've already said this. If you, think, if you think you're in one of these positions, then you want to go talk to your CO and get a 1094. The CO may come back and say, well, wait, I don't know if you're if we're exempt in this circumstance. And that's when that CO is supposed to go consult uh, legal counsel. Contractor has to be careful not to represent itself as an agent without authorization from the government. And that typically would mean getting a 1094 completed. Uh, and as I said, this can be an area of confusion for, next, uh, uh, for contractors. Uh, so you really have to take a hard look at what you're doing in a contract. Uh, next slide. actually. Um, okay. Uh, whenever any of these things apply, the government has various clauses as to put in uh, from FAR 29 that basically spell out some of the contractor's responsibilities um, under this FAR section and or uh, warn the contractor of things the government is not responsible. Uh, so you can always check 429 to see the clauses. Uh, I imagine you probably have not seen them in most of your contracts. You might have. Now let me talk about a practical example. Uh, this involved a pretty large company, and it was operating a, na a, na a naval ship. Okay, so the ship belonged to the Navy. And a private contractor was uh, engaged to operate this ship to map the ocean floor, and I'm pretty sure it was down off of the Florida coast, so in and around the Caribbean, I believe. And they claimed an exemption for the fuel that was being used on the ship, uh, an exemption from state and local taxes. And I, I, I don't recall the specifics of the case. I know they did not have a 1094, uh, but they somehow, you know, this is, uh, it's gotta be 20 years ago. Uh, they, they insisted to the local authorities that it was exempt, and I guess they wrote an explanation claiming why. But the but the local, the state and local, and I assume it was Florida, uh, did not get on board, and it imposed uh, various taxes. Anyway, the contractor 
appealed this decision to the Contract Court of Appeals, and then I can't remember if it went to the Court of Federal Claims or the Circuit Court, because you have an option when you're appealing. Uh, you first appeal to the government, and if the government doesn't um, find in your favor, then you have the option of going to the Court of Federal Claims or the Circuit Court for your for your uh, uh, region. Uh, and they went, and the decision was no. The the government merely furnished the ship, and then laid out the objectives of a contract for the contractor to complete, which was, you know, specifications as to this mapping that was to be done. And therefore, the diesel fuel was being consumed for the use of the contractor in performing the contract. It was not being purchased on behalf of the government. And they weren't entitled to a sales tax exemption, and they ultimately did not get one. And it, this was a uh, a ship that used a lot of diesel fuel, so there was a considerable amount of money involved. And so that's one of those cases where you know you might think you got a blurry line because you you know you you could make a case that that fuel was for the benefit of the government. Of course, if you're going to make that case, then you could arguably say a lot of other stuff that was used on the ship was purchased for the benefit of the government. That simply wasn't true, and they never even made that claim. So, uh, uh, you know, that's it. So let's go to the last slide. Uh, so as I said, the real takeaway from this, apart from anything you might've got from my discussion of income taxes at the outset, uh, the most important takeaway is determining when a purchase or lease is being made on behalf of the government, i.e. the government is the real purchaser and the contract is merely acting as an intermediary to facilitate that purchase, which is sometimes done. Uh, or uh, wh whether this is uh, something that's really being bought, uh, bought just in the routine performance of the contract, you know, stuff that's done all the time. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, the, when, when it is the government, there will be exemptions that apply, and you want to make sure that you know your own legal department or Contract Management Department takes whatever steps necessary with the CO in advance to ensure that you're covered. Uh, but in the second case, generally, you're going to find most of these exemptions uh, um, don't apply. I mean, well, you're, you're, you're the one that's actually buying and consuming uh, the products that are subject to tax. So that's the wrap up. And I hope everybody has a great day. And I think I understand this will be on, uh, uh, on the web somewhere posted. I think they usually do them on YouTube. Uh, and my contact information uh, was available on the first slide. And I'm, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. That's usually the best way to reach me. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for participating, and I uh, hope you have a great weekend. All right. Thank you so much for a great presentation, Don. Really appreciate your time. And to our audience members, we thank you again for participating with us. And uh, like Don mentioned, if you have any questions about this particular part, uh, his contact information is back up on the screen here. Also, if you have any questions about federal contracting or any assistance with any of our services in general, please contact us directly. Thank you again for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.